Dregs One. Welcome to another episode of the History of the Bay podcast. Shout out to our sponsors, Amoeba Music in San Francisco. Shout out to Dying Breed in San Francisco. Also got to shout out our new sponsors, STEM Social. And today behind the lens, we got King Said. On the boards, we got the one and only DEO. And today, we got another legendary guest. If you don't know this artist by name or by face, you definitely know his sound. It's your favorite, you know, the expression, your favorite rapper's favorite rapper, your favorite producer's favorite producer, somebody who gets talked about in the industry, but needs more exposure, I believe, because he's been putting in work for a long time and he is a Frisco legend and his resume speaks for itself. I can't wait to get into it. And of course, I'm talking about the one and only Cos Pacino, a.k.a. Cosmo. Appreciate you, my brother. Thanks so much for having me, man. Of course. Appreciate the good words, too, man. Thank you. You're welcome, man. Thank you for coming. We've been talking about doing this for a minute now. Yes, indeed. Glad it finally worked out. Absolutely, we man. here in the physical. Yes, sir, man. And we're back again. in the city, man. Yes, yes sir. sir. Thanks again to DEO for quarterbacking it, man. And um, uh, let's just get right into it. Like you, like you know how we always start these interviews at the very beginning. Uh, tell everybody where you were born and, and raised. Oh, uh, yeah. So I was born in the city, man. Uh, you know, born in Frisco. Long time ago, man. Uh, back in the, you know, late 70s. So I grew up, you know, in Frisco in the 80s. And then uh, I moved to Marin. So it was like a combination of Frisco and Marin. You know what I'm saying? So... Frisco to Marin. Yeah, 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 man. So, you know, I was born in the Avenues. Yes, sir. Um, I think like 22nd in Terraval. Okay. You know, I, T. Yeah, right by I the think, KFC. I think so, you Come know. the police then, station. Yeah, then we moved over to like the Noe Valley, Diamond Heights area. You know what I'm saying? So I was in Noe Valley and going up to Diamond Heights to the wreck and to the park and fucking around up there and shit. And, um... Yeah, like late elementary, I ended up moving out to Marin. Okay. okay. Yeah. So it was were a crazy you, transition. Yeah. What? Well, so what was that transition like? Um, I mean, man, I remember like me and my brothers and sisters, man, being in the back of that Volkswagen fucking station wagon drive. We had never been out the city really at that time. You know what I mean? So, um. I guess the biggest culture shock was like kind of like the lack of diversity and people like just people being out on the street. You know what I'm saying? You're going mm-hmm. from the city to like suburbs kind of. And it was just it wasn't quite as much action at that time. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's definitely a, yeah. a big change of pace. Mm-hmm. Um, what was your uh, home life like? Uh, my home life was it was cool, man. It was um a lot of love in the house, you know. My dad was a musician, um, like a hippie. You know, they came from the hippie era, so like the whole Grateful Dead, you know, that whole vibe was like uh, real present in the household. My pops, he played like with Jefferson Starship, also known as Jefferson Airplane, and so it was like a lot of musicians coming in and out the house, a lot of weed. Um, you know, pops was partying, doing his thing, and. Yeah, it was a mu- it was a musical household, you know, musical hippie household. I'd say, you know what I'm saying. So is that what brought them to to the Bay Area, the whole hippie movement? Um, well, my pops was from Cleveland, mm-hmm. which was a heavy, you know, music scene out there for like the soul stuff. Um, and my, you know, rock and roll too. It's the home of rock and roll. So my pops was uh he migrated from Cleveland. I think he came out to Cali to do music, and then my mom was like a I like a renegade hippie chick from New York who followed some of her like fellow musician buddies out to the West and they end up meeting in a club in the city and you know what I'm saying? Just hit it off like that. So a very musical household. Very musical. Yeah, very musical. Absolutely. What was your entry point into getting into music and specifically hip hop? Oh, man. Honestly, bro, like as early as I could remember, man, like four or five years old, I had an older brother who was, um, 
he was going to like Everett and Hoover at the time. So he was kind of getting laced on the hip hop stuff. And I remember him just like coming home from um, some record store with like the Houdini and Fat Boys and UTFO, Lisa Lisa, Kojan and the Michael Jackson shit. So it was like, bro, it was it was the only music I could ever like. The first music I remember was rap. You know what I'm saying? So it was like, yeah, it was it was heavily uh it was it was heavy in the household along with all the other stuff because my brother was like a big fan of that stuff too. So what about the local music? Um at that time, bro, there wasn't wasn't really a lot of local hip hop. You know what I mean? I was like, you know, you had home turf, you had K Poo. You had a couple little stations that would give you little glimpses of stuff, but the, the local shit didn't really come till later. Late 80s, early 90s, you know what I mean? So late 80s, early 90s, so that means you're hearing what, like Too Short or Man, totally honestly, insane? I think, or... I think some of the first Bay Area rap I heard was probably Forte and Huey MC. That's right. Yep, I remember going to my homegirl, Noelle, she took me to a, a Forte concert, I think. It was on Broadway. Maybe it was like DNA Lounge back then or some shit. But I'm talking about, bro, like, that must have been like late 80s, early 90s. You know what I'm saying? And I think, I swear, like Forte and, and Huey MC and them, they had to be some of the first dudes really putting it down. You know what I mean? Making noise. Absolutely. And then, like, Coognut. Mm -hmm. When I heard Scandalous, man, that was like a game changer. You know what I'm saying? So even though you're living in Marin at the time, the city's still a big influence to you. Yeah, yeah, the city's still a huge influence to me, bro. Like, I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for the city. You know what I mean? The city really made me who I was, man. Like, just the diversity, you know what I mean? Just growing up in the 80s and and just the, just the, the melting pot and the different people you were around and the breakdancing era and the hip-hop in the 80s and just first going to 80s man the Niners the Giants it was a it was a legendary time you know what I mean yeah for sure yeah we're gonna take a quick break from the episode to let y'all know about our latest sponsor STEM Social I would never endorse a product on this platform that I don't personally approve of and I've been trying STEM Social's five mushroom complex for a few weeks now it's the perfect supplement after my morning workout to help me stay mentally focused throughout the day and it even improves my sleep at night. There are a ton of benefits from Stem Social's Five Mushroom Complex, and they're all healthy, organic, and natural. I'm going to tell you how. The capsules contain extracts from turkey tail, reishi, cordyceps, chaga, and lion's mane mushrooms. These are some of the healthiest mushrooms out there, and different cultures around the world have used them for traditional medicine. So get on board. Check out the Five Mushroom Complex at stemsocial.io or click the links in the description. So what was your entry into being a fan of hip hop to, to going to actually making music yourself? To actually doing it myself was, yeah. um, I mean, I remember being young, man, and like scribbling shit. Like back then, we used to draw like breakdancing characters and shit as kids. You know what I mean? We used to draw the dude standing upside down, doing the head spins with the hats and the... the uh, you know, the the big radios and shit. And um, I, it was just like, man, it was I was just so heavily indulged in the culture back then, man. It was just like the rap, it was a natural progression, but I didn't start off good, you know what I mean? I didn't start off like a pro, like that shit, my shit was whack, you know what I'm saying? So really what I used to do, man, like the early GLP tapes, man, that shit gave me a lot of inspiration, a lot of motivation, um, I used to catch those tapes and then at the end where the beat would ride out by itself, I used to just try to freestyle over that shit just to hear how I would sound. You know what I mean? So like I had the voice, but I couldn't rap on beat, you know? So I was like, damn, man, my voice sounds cool. The shit I'm saying is cool, but I can't catch the beat. So I just start like freestyling and freestyling and making jokes, making raps. It was making fun of people's moms and joking around, making fun of kids, and shit, you know? And then little by little, I was able to find the beat. And then, you know, just, well, my pops, man, once he seen that I was that I had a little knack for music, he started bringing me four tracks, keyboards, 
drum machines, making my beats, playing the piano over. Like some of my first beats was my dad making my beats. So we used to have this Dr. Rhythm 606 little drum machine and you just find the best drum beat and he would just play some shit on top of it because, you know, back then you only had a few tracks. So and then I would just rap over that. And then, you know, once he saw I had a little knack, he started bringing the keyboard, showing me how to work the four tracks. And back then, like there was no looping, there was no sequencing. You had to you had to play the shit the whole time. The you know what I mean? No quantize, no yeah. nothing. This shit just sounded like a big mess. You know what I'm saying? And then, um, and then, uh, yeah, you know, you're talking about like early junior high, high school, other kids start kind of trying to do it. And I don't know, man, I just took that shit more serious than everybody else. I was in the back of my mom's garage, all the ADAT tapes and, um, you know, the homies that come through from the neighborhood or whatever we work for around and um everybody liked it but it was for me it was more permanent thing you know what i'm saying some kids would dabble f around for a minute then go back to doing whatever they was doing but like that shit never left me like i ain't take a break like oh i'm gonna quit and cook, try it again like no nah, it was just it was just um it was just always my passion you know what i'm saying so this is in marin this is in marin at this time yeah at this time i'm uh <clears throat> I'm in Marin. I'm in my mom's little garage in the back. Yep, just trying to figure it out, man. Really just a fan of the shit at that point, you know? And are you running into any other people who actually became artists from that area? Um, Later on, so like around seven. So Marin didn't have a lot. You had 5150 yep. back then, which is like a legendary group. You know, they rap with Pac. Um, they came up with Pac, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So... Um, that was like the main group from Marin at that time. Did anybody, you know, if you was, and they was popping and they was dope. They had the song, The Green and White is on my back. They had a bunch of shit and other people around the Bay respected them. So, you know, they, they were a respected group. And it was a brother named Tack from 5150 who was like the head of the shit. He caught wind of what I was doing and he pulled up and uh, came to the crib and started vibing with me and bringing me around, taking them places and shit. And, you know, we kind of just kicked it off like that. So rapping and producing basically came around the same time. Yeah. Yep. It did. But it was weird because, you know, when I started getting embraced by the local rappers, they didn't really fuck with my beats at the time. It was more like they was impressed by seeing, you know, probably seeing a white dude rap the way I was rapping at that time. That was a rare thing in the Bay at that time. Yeah. Well, I guess you had In Too Deep, right? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. I'm trying to think who else. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. And they were fired, too. Hell yeah. Shout out to It's Too Deep. Um, yeah. You know, another thing, too, I was going to ask you, man, because when I hear you rap and even some of your beats, uh, there's like a lot of sample. I mean, you do keyboard beats, too, but a lot of sampling. Was the East Coast sound a heavy influence to you? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. You kind of got like a new... I bet when you go to New York, you fit right the fuck in. Yeah, I do, man. I do. New York's like a second home, bro, yeah. for sure. I get that too, though, when I go out there because I feel like just being from Frisco, it's like, you know how to handle the city life a little bit and the diversity. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely. So the East Coast sound had a heavy influence on you. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, I had an uncle, man, my, my, my dad's brother, and every time he come out to Cali and visit... He would, he would, like, take me to the warehouse and buy me tapes and shit. You know what I'm saying? And he would always, like, buy me the Public Enemy, the Kid and Play, the, the um, De La Soul, the DJ Easy Rock, like, all the heavy East Coast shit. But I was still listening to, like, the Mafiosos and the, you know, the RBLs and, like, the Underground Bass shit. So I I just had a genuine love for both things, you know what I'm saying? It was just a um, it's just something about the the realness of the bass shit and then the intelligence and the lyrical shit of the East Coast shit, man. And I just felt like I'm a hybrid of that, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of that in Frisco because if you listen to the early RBLs, all sample based. Uh, if you listen to 
JT's production on that GOP album, he's using break beats. Yeah, absolutely. You can hear some Selsky beats where he's chopping samples Man. and using break beats too. Absolutely. The IMP shit too. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. That IMP shit sounds a lot like Public Enemy to me. Mm hmm. Uh, and again, I think it's kind of like, you know, they say Frisco is like the, the Manhattan of the Bay. Yeah. Yeah. We're the absolutely. Only, only, only place that's like really got that city metropolitan kind of vibe. Um, so you're you're trying to find your place. Um, who are some of the other artists you're collaborating with at this time, or are you just doing your own thing and pushing? So your own check line? it out. So at that time, right, um, like I told you, in Marin at that time, Fifty One Fifty was the only group doing anything. Mm -hmm. And um, once I hooked up with Tack, he started bringing me around. Like he started bringing me to the city, to Third Street, you know, to, to Reg and Race and. Introduced me to Killer Tay and, you know, my buddy Zaire from Marin City, who a lot of people don't know. He, you know, he was a uh, um, money and mind behind a lot of those early JT and Killer Tay albums and the Kaz album and things like that. So, um, yeah, Tack, man, he started bringing me around and I started with the Killer Tays and the JTs and the Quins and, you know, just... Uh, yeah, slowly but surely, man, these guys start embracing me, you know? And that, yeah. that really uh, starts with making beats for some of these guys, right? Or were uh, they putting, putting you on projects or doing songs with you? Nah, or? like the Killer Tay thing, it was the rap first. Okay. Yeah, it was the rap first. And then um, Quinn kind of started with some of my beats. And it was just a, uh, it was just a combination of shit. But really, um, most people... With my raps before the beats. Dope. Yeah. Yep. yep. So, what do you think was your first big break in terms of making music your career? Um, like as far as like a breaking point or like a accomplishment, like a like point a placement, to where, or just where my mind. Yeah, well, actually, was, let's go there. What was your first major placement in your in your opinion? Well, my first. Man, when Quinn was, a, we, we used to be up at J.R. Ryder's house. When Quinn was working on I Give You My Word and Tone, Tone Capone was up there doing his thing. And um, while him and Drop weren't like fucking with the MP, I would try to sneak in and, and make a beat. And um, I made this beat. It was a mob beat and it was just sitting up there. And, and Quinn took it and ended up turning into Northern California. So as far as like the Bay Area... I feel like that was the first album that I had a um I had a beat on. That was like my first placement in the bay. That but was, as far as like the point where I was like, fuck it, I'm Hold on, let me before you go there. Let me just let's just okay. stick to Northern okay, California. You got it. Cause that's a big song, right? It's a there. classic. It's a classic. Um it's crazy because we were just talking about the East Coast versus the Bay influence. Uh -huh. But that's like a straight Bay Area mob beat. Straight mob doubt. And um, it starts off the album, I Give You My Word. It's like track number one. So I believe so. Yeah, yeah, it's the first one you hear when you press play. Uh -huh. uh, and, you know, you know how it is with the Bay. It's like there's some songs that are so sacred and special to us that no one else in the... Gets in the, it. Yeah, they're like, what the fuck? Who the fuck yeah. is San Quinn? But yeah. over, and, and I remember when the album <laughs> came out in high school and... And all the kids from Filmo was like, yeah, Quinn dropping on Friday. Yeah, Quinn drop or Tuesday or whatever it was. New Quinn coming out next week. And Me um, too. that, yeah, I remember hearing that song. And that song is special too because he goes through the whole story of the Northern Cali rap scene. So I just say all that to say I could see how that song would be like a big deal for you to get your name out. It was. So, see, the thing about you, Kaz, is I, I know... I know so much of your work, but I, there's so much I don't know. But I, if you t like, I didn't know. You I didn't put two and two recall together, that you yeah. put, you were, uh, produced Northern California. Yeah. So I'm sure as we go through this interview, there's gonna be so many more gems. Read like, yeah, I did this. Yeah, I did this. I no, did this. absolutely, absolutely. So you know, and me being like such a big Quinn fan, that was dope, man. Because like I had songs rapping with him, but when he snatched that beat and did that record, I was like. That gave me a little hope to where I was like, all right. And really, it was Quinn and Mess, bro, that was fucking with my beats at that time. Um, well, well, speaking of, like, the East Coast influence, too, Quinn is special because he's considered the most lyrical 
a Frisco Bro. rapper, honestly, by a lot of people in the Bay. I mean, man, at 14 years old, that boy dropped his first album, bro. Yeah. And if you listen to Don't Cross Me, right in front of Papa, I was a pop guy, I was a looking right dead. And it's like, bro, he sounded like a grown man at 14, <laughs> man. Yeah. And and he was rapping as such, too, you know? And like I, like I said, I, I remember being in Marin and my boy Tim, who was going to high school out there, he was from The Point, you know? And he be, he was telling me about, oh, this kid, San Quinn, young baby boy Quinn. At that time, they just had the RBL, Frisco Ain't No Punk mm -hmm. uh, song out. And, you know, just off Quinn's verse on that, he had he had Frisco, Quinn, he had Frisco it, waiting it, on it, 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 it. I can't, I can't remember San Quinn from the SF to the Z. Yeah. He was going in on that song. He was going in, and I remember my boy just being like, yo, the streets is talking about this kid. He's the next dude up. And then, you know, I think it was live and direct, mm -hmm. special body of work. Then Hustle Continues. It's just like a... Classic. You know, that's like a Bible. Yes. That's like a Bible to me. Yeah. You know, and... Um, yeah, man. You know, Quinn, Quinn, bro, he's... He's our Jay Z, you know what I'm saying? I would agree. Yeah, he's yeah. our Jay Z, and so yeah, Quinn and Mess, bro. Between them two, um, was some of my first Bay placements. I remember Mess just being fresh out at Live Oaks and going over there with a um, hard drive full of beats and giving me like maybe a thousand dollars or something for like fifteen beats or something at the time. You know what I mean? <laughs> but it was all love, man. We was just working, and I was just happy to get my name out. You know what I'm saying? And and um, I just had my kid around that time, and I remember just telling myself, like, yo, don't quit your job until you can make whatever you're making at your job. You can you can supplement off the music. So as soon as I got to that point, I, I said, F*** the job, you know? And at that point, I think I was living in Petaluma. Like, look what I done for them, them records. It was all done in my bedroom, you know? Yeah, let's keep going through the discography a little bit because yeah. I don't like you said we're gonna do a classic interview and I don't want to I don't want to no, skip we don't, over, we don't any skip those, over man. anything. Yeah, no, so definitely. Let's go back to Mesh. What were some of the first joints that you were producing for him? Because for Mesh, yeah, if you're talking the early 2000s, this is when he was really. On I fire. mean, the notable one I think that most people know is um I just want to be yours, which was on the um. Bandanas, tongue rings, and tattoos or some shit. Yeah, like. bandanas, tattoos, and tongue rings. Yeah, so that was the most notable one. And then, aside from that, I did that whole Click Clack album. It was like Stunners, Scrapers, and White Tees, the one that had Dope Dealer on there. That's another mess record that people really like, the Dope Dealer one. Mm -hmm. I, I did that record, too. So, um, as far as the Messy Marv catalog goes, that was like the majority of the shit that I did for Mess. You know what I mean? Because, um, you know, it's just start trying to focus on other things. Another thing for me, too, was understanding that the business in the Bay was kind of limited as far as how much you could charge the artist. So in order for me to quit my job selling 15, 12 beats for, you know, $1,500 ain't going to really pay my bills long term. Are you saying it's limited because it's all independent as opposed to... It's limited to because being with the, the Bays is own industry, bro. Yeah. You know, meaning it had its own rules. But you I was, was going to say, if you're with, if you're like, let's say you're an L.A. or New York producer, you might be uh, submitting beats to Atlantic or... You know uh, why? To because Def in Jam L.A. and New to, York... Oh, sorry. sorry no, no, no. Up. Yeah, I was just saying you're submitting beats to, to major labels as opposed to... For artists like Mess pulling out a bankroll and being like, here. Exactly, bro. So, you know, at that time, New York and L.A., those were real industries. You know, you had studios. You That's where all the major labels were. But in the Bay, everything was more so a work for hire. I'm yeah. going to give you a few hundred dollars and that's it. Yeah. You know what I mean? You'd be lucky to get credit on the album. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? So Yeah, for real. Um, the Bay is just was, just, you kind of had to learn how to, you know, the the... The real industry versus what was the independent industry, you know what I mean? And you learn a lot and, you know, phenomenal, some phenomenal people came about the Bay and even the business, you know, people were able to figure it out and do good business. You got plenty of people that are managing huge artists from the Bay now, so they, they were able to figure it out. But as far as me back then, um, the whole work for hire thing was just like, that was cool for a temporary you know, pay the bills this month. But like, 
you know, once you start realizing, like, yo, I got to get placements on artist albums that got real machines behind them. You know what I mean? Um, at the end of the day, it's about the machine behind the artist because uh, that's who you're going to to get paid from. I don't want to be jamming up some, you know, street dude for some money. It's like I want to jam up the label, you know. So I just start shopping beats, start, you know, sending shit to Dipset, to this guy, to Dre, whoever it was at the time, G-Unit, you know what I mean? You just start learning the art of shopping your beats, sending them out, trying to get bigger placements, trying to get shit. And it wasn't because I didn't love the artist in the Bay. It was just because it wasn't lucrative at that moment. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I feel you. Before we talk about that, because I want to go in deep there, I do want to bring it back because I said we ain't skipping nothing. Mm -hmm. And the San Quinn, look what I done for them. Mm -hmm. That was on that album right there, The Rock, mm -hmm. I believe. That had a video. An epic video. Epic video. That was like... That's crazy that that song was so big because, I saw, man, I feel like so many artists are trying to chase a hit. Yeah. Right? Like, what's popping on the radio? What's, but sometimes the best thing to do is to tell your story. And that song right there is a perfect example of that. And he, like you said, rapping since he was 14, that's an incredible story to tell. Uh what did you record that beat with? Record that song with mm -hmm. you? Too? So, what was the process of y'all making that track? And what was your reaction when you heard what he was doing with your beat? Man, so you know, bro, like at that time, man, like I was all in with Quinn. Like, you know, I was hoping Quinn was gonna blow and take us all with him. And, you know, I was the producer and giving them all my best beats and, you know, just honored to be working with them and, and, and to be able to witness some of that magic, you know what I'm saying? Because he, when, when he was on, it was just magical, bro, you know? So I think that was just a day, man, another day of just working. I actually believe uh, Hollywood, who's in the back, I think he was at the house when shout we did that. Shout out to Hollywood. Yeah, shout out to building. God, Holly, yeah. And um, I believe Young Galaxy Adams was downstairs probably playing with my kid in the living room. You know, and, and um, yeah, just played a couple beats. And once I heard the God is the greatest, then I believe much in him. Like, once I heard, like, that song still gives me chills to this day, bro. And another story behind that record, that record actually did a lot for me, man, because Will Bronson ended up playing that record for Scarface. And yes. Scarface, for people who don't know, he actually... Is a, it was always a fan of Quinn. Well, he ended up flying me out to work on his album because of that song. So I and Tone Capone reached out to me. Big shout to Tone, and um, he brought me uh, he brought me to Houston with him. And Will Bronson played the record for Face. Face loved it. it was like, yo, I want to get some production from this kid. And Tone Tone brought me out there, and one of my first big rap checks was from Rap a Lot. You know? That's what's up, bro. Yeah, stayed at Face's crib for like a month, you know, a couple times. So that was legendary, you know what I'm saying? So that that record got, you know, made that moment happen for me, man. So it might have not have been a huge financial game, but like with me, bro, it's money is nobody sees the money. You know, nobody listens to the money. You know what I'm saying? It's the music, bro. Yeah. The money is just all our favorite artists died broke. You know, we don't care how rich you are. It's like the music talks to us, you know? So for me, like, my attachment to the music has always been the emotional effect of music. Not the technical, lyrical, miracle, da da da, -da just creating words that go, there's always the shit that makes the hair stand up. The Oof. shit that gives you the chills. You know what I Get mean? The chills right now. He dropping gems. Yeah, yeah. That's my attachment to the music, bro. It's like music is is is, 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 is you know the mood. You know whatever. It, whether it's an old school record, a rap record, R and B, whatever it is, it's like the emotional element is what drives me to it. Well, you know? a song like like that, you can't you can't fake it. You can't fake the reality and the emotion that goes into. It's something weird when you're making a beat too, because your mood, your energy can go into the beat. Absolutely, and create 100%. that kind of palette for artists to capture that same feeling with words. A million percent, bro, because 
my music is actually a reflection of my mood. Yes. A lot of the times, you know, like I don't go in and just create and just try different new shit and say, today I'm going to wake up and try to do some shit for Busta Rhymes. It's like, nah, bro, I just do my shit. And if it fits for that person, so be it. But like, I'm not chasing, you know, it's, it's like, it's like I heard something back in the days and I just got stuck on it. You know what I mean? And like, I don't really, I don't really um, steer away from that. I'm cool with being like the one trick pony. Like, all oh, cause this beats all sound like I'm cool with that. You know what I'm saying? Because uh, at the end of the day, I like to have an identity. And I like for somebody to not, I don't need a beat tag. A motherfucker could hear the beat mm. and be like, damn, that's that's cause. Mm -hmm. I mean, not to that degree, but like almost. Like now, Rick Rock, that's somebody you really know. Either that's Rick Rock or somebody stole that shit. And You know what I mean? But like my sound, I say, is is a little more like common. Like you, you know, especially nowadays, a lot of people are fucking with the the vocal samples and the ear. I was going to bring that up because to go back to look what I've done for them, this is like, what, 2003, something like that? 2006. 2006. Okay, so... Uh, 2004. Oh, four four mm -hmm. So this is like the era of Kanye through the wire. Yeah. That's when he really changed the game and, and um, obviously he wasn't the only one, but this is when that sound is kind of uh, becoming a little more widespread. Um, so I could see why Scarface would hear that and be like, oh, boom, that's that shit right there. I need something like this. I always look at, you know, uh, yeah, absolutely. And if you listen to Face and you know what kind of artist Face is, he's a, um, I, you can tell he has that emotional draw to the music too. Yeah. I always look at artists that, like, you got two kinds of rappers, right? You got ones that can just put words together in like an Eminem, right? Mm -hmm. um, and not to never discredit Eminem, right? He's as great as we all know he is. But then you got an artist like, say, a Pac, right? Who's not known for cramming a million words in a, in a pattern, right? Yeah. In a flow pattern. But the emotional element is undeniable. Absolutely. And so, like, for me, I look at, like, when I rap, like, I don't have to sit here and think of a million words. You know what I mean? It's just play off of, like, I need to read a book first. Or I need to look at a dictionary to come up with all these cool big words. I look at it like I'm just going off the heartfelt aspect of it. Like, whatever this song, however it's talking to me, you know. Um, so to me, yeah, so it's, it's two ways to approach music. It's like from a, a, you know, a thought process or just like the emotional process you know go with your heart or your brain are you writing from the brain or are you writing from the heart you know dig that yeah so what's it like working with Scarface in the studio oh man I mean I mean I was I, I, you know uh, let me let me let me how do I phrase this you know what I'm saying first of all it's like it was surreal at that point man because I hadn't been worked with nobody on that level like I had worked at Nip at that time but Nip wasn't nip yet. You know what I'm saying? Like he was still a nip. Yeah, he mm -hmm. was still a up and coming. He wasn't like a legendary hip hop guy like Face was at that time yet. Mm -hmm. You know? So um man, I was just kind of playing my role, just a student, just a fly on the wall, kind of just letting him and Tone do their thing, because they already had a rapport, you know, Tone was already responsible for so many um classic face records that I was just kind of like, you know, just following his lead on everything, like, as far as what Face likes and shit like that. But, um, yeah, man, I mean, and honestly, at that time, it was a time where Face wasn't really motivated to work, man. He was in, you know, it was kind of hard to get him in the studio. Even though we went out there to work, it was like, shit, we was there for a month. We maybe hit the studio a few times, you know what I'm saying? What like, were you doing the rest of the time? Just chilling? Ch cracking jokes. Really? Looking at funny shit. On YouTube, goofy <laughs> shit, you know, clowning. <laughs> I was turning him on to Kimbo Slice and like, oh, this was like, he had his, his, his neighbor, DJ High C, looked just like Kimbo Slice. He'd be like, gosh, my neighbor's Kimbo's coming over. Man. We just joke, man. You know, still to this day, he'll hit me and be like, gosh, send me some funny shit. You know, like, I need some shit to laugh at. So we bonded way deeper than the music, man. That's my bro to this day. Like, he up. called me. We don't even, it's never about no music. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dope, bro.
think he just, you know. Yeah, 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 that was cool, man. But yeah, that was a surreal moment. And, and that all happened from the Quinn. Look what I've done for them. And shout out Will Bronson. You know what I'm saying? Shout my brother Will. Or oh, uh, just to like stick with the timeline too. I also I don't want to skip over your solo albums that oh, you're yeah. releasing too. So your your debut album came out early 2000s as well. Yeah, yeah. Cos Pacino. Mm-hmm. DL loves that album. Mm-hmm. He's a big advocate for that album. I love that. Love that man. Love you for that. What was the process of putting that out? Okay, so the process of putting that out was um, around that time I was on a lot of the JT and Killer Tay shit. Mm-hmm. You know, shout to Zaire, you know, from the jungle, man. He uh, he pulled me in. I mean, he was the first one to invest into me, put a lot of money up for that album, you know, made sure I was a lot on all the projects he was funding at that time, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a real good brother to me, man, you know, and, and uh, I always credit him to this day, you know, for that man and just being a, a mentor and a and a and a brother and an investor, you know, at that time. But um yeah, so you know, um I when he put it, they 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 put out Snake Eyes, you know, the Killer Tay album and that did real well. And I was rapping on about like I don't know, five, six, seven songs on that album, you know what I mean? Shout to Tay too, man, for for extending the platform and being being the guy he was to me at that time too, man, is just super super loyal, man. Like no other, you know. Um, so that album really set me up for a lot, man. And um, after people hearing me on that project, they was waiting on my solo, sh- you know what I mean. So I was working with One Drop Scott mainly at that time, who I met through Tay and Zai and everybody, and. Um, me and Drop, it was like my mentor, man. He's like a second father to me, you know what I mean? But at that time, we were just kind of hitting it off, just kind of just kind of meeting and getting going. And um, I remember Zai gave him the money to, you know, gave him the advance to start working on my project. And we hit West Oakland, the studio over in like uh, uh, 7th and Peralta. And uh, my boy G, Westbound Studios, man, it's a classic place. A lot of cool sessions, a lot of dope people came through there. Um, and then, yeah, I just started working with Drop closely, man. And I felt like it, it, it was like a dream come true, man. Because at that time, like Drop, whatever sound or whatever vision or whatever you wanted to do, like he was a real musician. Like he wasn't like a producer faking the keys. Like he came from playing with Sheila E and, and uh, you know, Bill Summers and, you know, playing on big records and it was just another level of production for me, you know, seeing what Drop can do. And, like, I don't even think I made a beat on my first album. Mm. You know what I mean? That's Yeah, I don't even think I made one beat on my first album. The thing with me, too, is I always like other people's production to rap on. Yeah, I think when you're a producer uh, and rapper, it's kind of... You- you get kind of not tired of your own sound, but it's just like I just need something to catch something me a little from, more fresh. And, yeah, something yeah. to catch me from left field sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, because yeah. like if you're making the beat and rapping to it, by the time the song, the beat is done, you've heard it you've so heard it much. A it's like times, yeah. I remember back in the days, like if I was gonna write to a beat, I I wouldn't listen to it that much because yeah. it wears off. Yes, you know it does. what I'm saying? It's like mm-hmm. oh damn, the vibes wearing the sound. So like even old. listening to songs you recorded. Gets that way too. I want when I lay drops. some the freshest thoughts to be, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like your fresh thoughts need to go on that beat. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. anyways, yeah. So we spent a lot of money on that album, bro. We mixed that on the SSL board. We did that at um Laughing Tiger Studios out in San Rafael. I had Keisha Cole on that album. I think I paid Keisha fifty dollars to do that hook. God damn. Real talk. No disrespect. Truth. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so you got everybody starts somewhere. Fifty dollars, man. You know what I'm saying? It's a funny <laughs> story. So she used to be in the studio in the West at that time a, a lot, right? In West Oakland, and um, I was at the Magic Show with Zaire. We at the Magic Show, man. We're in like the actual convention thing. And I'm drunk and I'm feeling myself. I'm hollering every little b- in there, you know, and. I see, I'm, I'm talking to some chick, you know, and I'm talking to her and I'm like, yo, yo, what's up, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, yeah, yeah, my name's Keisha. I'm from town. I'm like, oh, yeah. Um, I'm like, she's talking about how she do music. I'm like, I didn't recognize her because she was all dolled up, you know what I mean? But she had just did the song for me like a week <laughs> ago. We was in the studio together and I'm talking to her and I'm like, 
you just did a hook for me. And she's like, yeah, you owe me some money. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit. So it's later that night, we like at the club. She danced with some dude. I'm dancing with some chick. We, we see each other. And then when we got back to the base, she hit me. She was like, yo, I need that. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? She needed her issue, man, even at that time. And, you know, but um, also I had J.R. Rodham on that album, bro. Like who, you know, a lot of people know him. He's a legendary producer, CEO, you know, he found Sean Kingston and Jason Derulo and all those guys. And a friend of mine found him out in Davis. He was going to school out there making beats, just f***ing around. And I pulled up on him and we hit it off, man. And I I had to say probably some of his first, I probably was the first person to buy beats from him, you know. And he went on to be mega, mega successful. That's crazy. So, yeah, that album had a little backstory, a little couple, couple legendary people involved, you know. How how was the reception? I mean, man, it was supposed to do more. Like it was supposed to get distributed, and just some little shit happened, and it didn't. It didn't. They didn't press up quite as many copies as they should have. But the people that know about it, it's like a little street classic. You know what I'm saying? People will still hit me randomly and be like, "Yo, that Cosbuccino album, da 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 da." You know. And that's all. That's I mean, that serves its purpose to me. You know what yeah. I mean? At that time, I would have loved to make a ton of money off it. But looking back, for me, it's just to have some dope shit. That yeah, yeah, yeah. It's part of the legacy. It you did know what, what it was saying? supposed to do. It was dope for that time. Like, mm-hmm. you could even go back and listen now and hear, like, some of the quality and musicality in it. It was, you know, it wasn't like, at that time, it was pretty advanced. It wasn't like typical shit. You know what I'm saying? Well, when you were talking before about how to really make this to make enough money to feed your kids and and pay your bills and all that you were talking about focusing on getting placements yeah so i think for for a lot of artists right like we talked about kanye earlier that's how he got his foot in the door um producer for other people so how did you <clears throat> go about getting getting your foot in the door in terms of um uh, you know, getting submissions and Great stuff like question, that. Great question, man, because I always looked at it like, at one point, I had to put the rap to the back burner and focus on the production because yeah. I always, like, I always been very, like, conscious of, like, you know, as a white rapper, man, being a cornball. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's a very thin line. Mm-hmm. Let's just keep it a buck, right? So, I got to a point where I was like, yo, like, I can't just walk up on these rappers, like I can't because of who, like, because of how I conduct myself and just be like, yo, hear me out. Let me spit you 16 and like hope a, a Jim Jones or a, some, a fabulous or someone's going to sign you on the spot. It's like, it was far fetched. So I just kind of thought about it like this like, yo, I'm going to use my beats and that's what I'm going to push to the artist. I'm going to always stay nice with the pen. And then if that one day I get in the studio with the right person, I could present my shit. And they're going to be blown away because they were never expecting it. You know what I mean? And so that was kind of always my theory, like the element of surprise. Hit them with that. So Use the beats to kind of get in the game, to get in the industry, to get around the people that are, that are of some kind of significance. And then back norm with the raps. Yeah. I mean, but when you talk about um, going for placements and stuff, you're making connections uh, personal connections, you're making label connections, manager connections. Yeah, so, so, yeah, exactly. So back then, a little bit of everything. Back then, it was different, right? Because now you got IG, you got all this shit. You can just send your favorite rapper a DM and they might send you an email. Or they might have their send beats to this address. Yeah, so like back in my day, I had to go to the show with a beat CD, wait for the artist come out the back door and try to stop them and be like, yo, here's my beat CD, you know, or get a number like that. Like, it wasn't phone, cell phones where you can just put somebody's number in a phone, you know, text somebody. It was like, bro, you had to go out to meet your favorite artist if you wanted to get the music, you know what I mean? Especially, like, being where I was at and the resources I had, you know what I mean? I remember catching Mess and Quinn through at Maritime Hall during the explosive mode era, you know, stopping them, getting their number. I still got, like, me and Quinn met the same night I met my wife at Maritime Hall. 
You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's crazy. But, like, that's what I mean. Like, you actually had to be out to try to meet these people. Like, I remember, you know... What was what was across the street from Palady, uh, 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 from from Maritime? Was that Sound Factory, right there on First and Mission? Uh, it was, yeah, I'm right not sure. There. Yeah, yeah, I remember like you know certain artists having shows and us just posting up and waiting to try to catch them when they was coming out to give them a beat CD or or get a number or something like that, you know. Um, but yeah, it was like. If you got a line, like if you had a homie that knew somebody and was like, oh, my boy knows Fab or I'm going to be in the studio with Dre or my buddy knows this. And, you know, you just kind of had to kind of it, it was a, it was a slightly different. It was very different from what it is today. That's for sure. But, um, yeah, you know, managers, A&Rs, artists. I always like dealing with artists direct. Yeah. Because there's too many people, different people to please, you know what I'm saying? But you got to play the game. Sometimes it, you might not have that, um, you might not have that advantage to get straight to the artist. So you got to do what you got to do, you know? Well, you mentioned uh, Scarface, which was a big record for you. So what, outside of the Bay, what were some of your first successful placements? Um, uh, I say, uh, Scarface. Well, I mean, like some of the placements that I got, some of them might not even had money attached, but you used them. You know, it's kind of like you put them on the resume. Yep. Some of the shit might have been like Dipset, shit, Hell Rail, Devin the Dude, um, Scarface, The Game, Nipsey at that time. I had did some of his early joints. Uh, Trina, we did some shit. Trina, but that a little later on, I started working with Po' Boy Records, like around '08, maybe Briscoe and Billy Blue, and and um, they had like Ross had just left around that time. They're like a famous, popular, like legendary Miami label. Um, so yeah, you know, man, I um, like it's, a, a lot of the shit I was doing too, bro. Is like not everything you get paid for. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean, like. These wasn't life changing placements. There was it was excuse me. At the time, like you don't it, how do I say this? There's so many times where I got a placement and was like, yo, this record's gonna change my life. <laughs> this is gonna be the one. <laughs> this is gonna it's, it's it was never the one. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like I always tell people, it's never gonna be one thing. It might be a series of little things that lead up to wherever you're at, you know, but it's not, it was never one record. It just was like the pivotal thing for me. It was always just a ton of smaller things, you know what I mean? It, yeah. it, was, it was like, I never, I never had the Justin Bieber hit or like, you know, the, the, the record that was a number one single just spinning everywhere. But I had a bunch of things that were still semi-significant that, you know, still created me a decent catalog. I think you're being a little humble right now, man, because you got a plaque or two at the yeah, house. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. No, no, absolutely, man. Absolutely. But, um, no, no, man, I'm very, I'm very... He's being uh, humble as hell. This boy platinum, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very grateful, man, for everything, you know, and the people I worked with, bro, like, you know, it's Starting off from where I started off, this shit was just a dream, you know. What I'm no, saying? yeah, I'm just messing around. I mean, yeah. I, I understand what you're saying because, well, sometimes it's bigger, you know. And I'm not trying to downplay it, you know what I mean. Yeah, but yeah, like, yeah. you get to a point where you realize, like, damn, you know, maybe I'm still gonna have to supplement my income. Now I need to get another revenue stream because I'm putting all my eggs in this music shit. And it's only getting me so far financially, you know? Yeah. I mean, I was going to say, you, you get to... I deal with so many artists just talking to them, right? Yeah. In addition to, like, my own history. And what I learned is, really, the the only thing you can do is just keep going and keep doing shit. There's no... I don't do this shit for money, bro. Yeah, and there's no... There's no... You but can, I don't do it for free, either. That part. But there's no, like, blue, there's no one blueprint... To be like, this is how you get a career in music. Nah, it nah, really has it to be bro. just, if you want to have a career in music, just keep doing music. But do it to the best of your ability and, and take it seriously and, 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 and do as much as you can to, to do that this, right. This, this is what I recommend to like the young people in, in doing music is have your primary source of income be something else. 
so you can do what you want with the music. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because otherwise you're at the mercy of the dollar, man. Like yeah. I remember having to pay rent, it being the 29th. And a messy Marv might hit me, Kaz, I need some beats. You know, Jackson, I need some beats. He might have, what you got, 1,200 for eight beats. And I just got to do it because I got I got to pay the bills, bro. I didn't have money coming from, no, I wasn't selling weed. I wasn't doing shit. I was surviving solely off music. And by the grace of the universe, man, I don't know how I made it through <laughs> some of that shit because looking back now, I, I was making more money then because mm. now... I don't really sell a lot of independent beats. Like, now I tell a dude a crazy number just to leave me the fuck alone. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Because I don't even want to do it. Yeah. I don't even want to tarnish my legacy with some whack shit. I like that. And I feel like, yo, some of these dudes haven't even rapped along long enough to even earn that, bro. Like, mm -hmm. Michael Jordan ain't going to go play one-on-one -on -one with a kid who's in high school. Mm -hmm. You still got to go through the You got to go through the levels. It's even levels, if his daddy bro. is a billionaire. Yeah, so it's like, I don't know, man. I'm, I, and it's fucked up because I'm not taking my own advice. Like, I always tell Brian, I'm like, man, you better get it while they're getting this good. Keep, you know, like, we ain't going to be hot forever. Don't pass up, month, you know, because his bag, the type of bags he be getting is different. But I'm just saying, like, man, I'm not, I'm not taking everything that lands on my doorstep. If it's whack, bro, like, I don't even want to do it. I don't, like, what you got to understand, too, man, is that shit's on iTunes. So... Now, you know, when people go to search your name and search your catalog and look your shit up, now you got a stain. You got a wax song. Somebody gave you two bands for a beat or a verse or whatever the f Now your name's that's attached to something wax. That's just yeah. forever, bro. Mm -hmm. So, um, if I don't have to, uh, I, I won't even do it at this point. I done made it this far. Like, not meaning like, I'm just saying, I'm this far down the road, why start f***ing my shit up now? Well, what were your biggest placements and what, where did your plaques come from? Um, I say this Wiz Khalifa. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, the king of everything. Uh -huh. Something I did. Um, that went gold. That was probably, um, probably one of my big, bigger songs. Um, then the El Chivo record I did with Burn actually went platinum. Crazy. Actually, and that, that one means a lot because, you know, me and him been grinding together for almost 20 years or some shit. And, bro, you know, Burn was the underdog, man. So for him to be getting gold and platinum records, bro, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's such a beautiful thing, man. And that guy worked hard, man. And he per persevered through so much hate and so much, you know, uh, naysayers. And, you know what I mean? The people just thinking he couldn't pull it off, man. So it's like... Bro, to be independent and have, even if it was just one goal record, man, it's phenomenal, bro. That's life goals, man. So, um, those are two of them, you know. Uh, then I like, I, I, I value the stuff I did with Nip, you know, just, cons you know, it, it didn't chart. Or, you know, I might have charted like on billboards and shit, but like I didn't get a plaque from it. But, um, but you had a longstanding relationship with him. I did. Mm -hmm. I did, man. I was had a, it, I had a like, genuine relationship with Nip. What was it like working with Nipsey? Um, man, so I actually met Nip for the first time All-Star Weekend in Vegas, man. He wasn't going by Nip. Uh, my boy Fats introduced me to him. He was going by Slauson Boy still. We was just in the palms, like in the in the lobby, and my boy Fats was like, yo, Kaz, you know, introduce you to my boy Slauson Boy. He be buying beats and shit. He was just another kid, and I was like, oh, okay, cool. Didn't think nothing of it, right? Fast forward like a year or two later, Johnny Shipes hits me up. He's like, yo, I got this. I was just meeting him. And he was like, I guess what happened was he had got a beat pack of mine and Nip ended up using one of the beats. And it was a joint me and my dad actually produced together. And it ended up being a song called They Roll, which featured the game. Nip ended up going on tour with Game after they did that record. I mean, I don't know if that was the cause, but they they hit it off. And that was one of Nip's bigger, earlier records. You know what I mean? And um, Shipes ended up flying me to New York to go work with Nip. So the first time I met him, Vegas, I met him in L.A., but the first time we really locked in was like New York. You know, and I remember us both being locked out of the studio, waiting for them to come let us in. Him super LA'd out in New York, you know, <laughs> Dickie shorts, wife beater, 
You know what I mean? It was hot. And me and him just talking like on the steps while we're waiting. And just like, man, he w- it was just like a, a, you know, like even talking, getting up halfway through, hugging. It was like my first real encounter with him. Like, and it was super brotherly, man. You know what I mean? He was just a genuine dude. Uh, very like a, a no bullshit kind of guy. Low tolerance for disrespect kind of dude. But like serious about his craft man and like um you know uh it's like every project even though like i wish we would have had a bigger body of work together man and that's when like that's why now like i don't let the business stop me from working with people as much because i look back and be like damn if i wasn't worried about money and shit i would have had a bigger catalog with these people and it would have meant so much more but at that time, you don't know. You don't know what the unfortunate outcome of certain things could be. But um, uh, uh, just the, the the short of it, man, is that, you know, every project he did pretty much up to the end, he always reached out, always, always hit me up looking, you know, looking for records. And we stayed in touch. And, it, it, you know, luckily, man, you know, maybe like a week or two before he passed, I actually had through a kid named Casey Khalil that was working with him. We He cut a record. We did something new. After the Victory Lap album came out, we had cut a new record. And then, oh, bro, like, I swear to God, like, five days later, he passed away. Wow. But between that, like, a month or so before, I got, like, man, because when he was working on Victory Lap, I was blowing him up. I'm like, man, this fool ain't hitting me back, you know? Like, he ain't fucking with me no more. But, like, I was like, nah, that like I'm I had like six numbers on him. I'm like, I'm just gonna text the same message to every phone to this fool hits me back, you know. Finally he hit me back and I got to give him his flowers and shit, you know, and just tell him how solid he'd always been and blah blah blah. And he, you know, told me the, the same and it was like we gave each other our flowers and then that was that, you know. But um in between that also I, I did something on the Crenshaw album. So I got to be a part of that album, which was pretty legendary. I did the weather featuring Rick Ross. So a lot of you know, a lot of people love that song too, you know what I'm saying? So I'm just happy I got those couple notches in the legacy with him, man. And I know I got to, you know, give him his flowers from a grown man's, you know, perspective, you know, shortly before he passed. So like, yeah, those records I hold close to heart, man, because it was just a different dude, man. You know, somebody that invested so much into his intellect and his intelligence and investing and like all that shit so early on. You know, he's way younger than me, way ahead of me, knowledge wise, you know? And so I just felt like, man, it was such a waste to see somebody that invested so much into himself to be this intelligent, godly dude, you know, to just snap of a, you know, gone like that. I was like, damn, what a waste, man. Well, it's amazing that you got to play that part, bro. And that's also one of the dope things about being a producer is being able to develop other people's talent and see where they take it along the way, you know? No, absolutely, man. Absolutely. I mean, bro, I I watched him go from, you know, mixtape nip to victory lap nip and to me like it's gonna be so hard like bro like you know when Pac died we were all looking for someone to fill that void you had Ja Rule you had DMX you had these dudes come out none of them really quite felt filled that void you know and it's like when Nip passed man like that album bro it, 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 it nobody is nobody has dropped something similar since you know and it's like who do we look to to fill that void that street intellectual void you know like that you're gonna buy it and we're gonna actually buy it you know like like who's gonna be as gangster and as smart as Nick that's why we love Pac because he was gangster but he was smart well some people try to discredit Pac was gangster and super smart so it was like the the phenomenon of the two how can you be this you know this street dude, but with this crazy intelligence, it was like the shit that Nip and Pac were on. At you know, Pac was on in his early twenties. I still in my forties haven't grasped. You know what I mean? It's just like 
some people just are, are, are cut from a different cloth, man. And those two dudes are definitely that, man. I feel the same way. That that's that's a huge loss. And um yeah, I I look at Nip the same way I look at Pac. It's something deeper than the music, but you know, he just meant so much to so many people. So that's incredible that you, that you got a chance to work with him so closely for so long. Absolutely, man. For sure. I wanted to go back to Burner real quick because uh we just had Shemp on here. Mm-hmm. And Shemp was part of Burner's journey from an early time. I, this is when I first met Burner, right? Like the early 2000s, kind of what you were saying, the underdog. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew he was going somewhere. I couldn't envision that it was going to be as far as he took it. Um, but I remember and he was really ahead of his time and really smart in terms of the music business of like, Shemp's going to do all my covers. Best in the game. I'm going to get features from the best in the game. I'm going to do albums with the best in the game. And I'm going to have production from the best in the game, which I remember was primarily, uh, well, there was Dunce, Stingy, and then... That was more before. That was before. Yeah. That was, that's what I'm saying, when I first met him. Yeah. Then it was Genesee. He was working Mm -hmm. really closely with Genesee. And then Man, my boy does his homework. He <laughs> no, I was there. I was there. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not even going to say you do your homework. You just, yeah, exactly. I was there. I remember. You know your shit. Yeah. Because yeah, I'm talking about like the sequence of how it happened, man. Yeah. This that's, is that's, just some shit I saw dope. unfold. And then. Uh, that's impressive. Then yeah. I remember you came around. Mm hmm. And um, so, what was the first time that you met Burner? Through Genesee. Okay. So, so, so there you yeah, go. Through okay. Genesee. So, yeah, you. This, that's why I said the. The series of events, you had it down pat. So, um, Genesee, you know, he he had a collective called the Noble House. And that yeah. was all of us. Shout out to El Rock, El Ronius. El Rock, El Ronius. Mm-hmm. Yep. All, all those guys, you know, Manny. We were all homies doing music under one umbrella. You know, Genesee, he took me under his wing, bringing me out, making me perform. Just, you know... Just bringing that East Coast element out to the West, because you know he's from Brooklyn. He's banging out the hip hop beats on the NPC. A lot of those beats, I I loved because I was rapping the way I was rapping. So, um, long story short, we had a collective called the Noble House, man, and I met Burner over at Jen's crib, which was the Noble House, and um, you know he was just like, "Yo, I'm trying to get some beats," you know what I'm saying? So, um. I think like a couple of days later, brought him up to, went and swooped him up. You know, burned on drive. Yeah. You know, never, <laughs> never. That's another thing I remember too, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we drove up to SAC and, and, and we just hit it off, man. We was crank calling people, goofing off, you know. Burn turning us on to all the good restaurants and shit back then, you know. We didn't know what good food was yet. Um... But as far as the music, man, we just locked in, man. I still remember the first couple records we did. I think they ended up on Weekend at Bernie's, you know? And, um, yeah, like like you said, man, like I couldn't, I, I, you know, I'd be lying if I said, oh, I knew Burn was going to be as big as he is today. But I will say he had a determination I hadn't seen like in any of my friends. You know what I mean? Like, he wasn't taking no for an answer, bro. Like you said, he had a plan. You know, I'm going to I'm gonna basically do, do songs and albums with your favorite artist, but at a higher level, at mm-hmm. a higher quality level. Yep. I'm going to get the best artwork. I'm going to get the best beats. I'm going to mix and master my shit. Um, I'm going to get dope features. I'm going to shoot dope videos. I mean, he never really cut no corners, And man. he was uh, light years ahead of branding himself with weed. Where there was stone, shit. Been stoner rapper since the beginning, but he was the first person to represent strains of weed and incorporate that into his Man. artistry, into his marketing, and into his. Promotions. That's a whole nother level to his genius. Is the dude is a visionary, bro. Mm-hmm. He has the ability to see like years ahead. You know what I mean? He's like light years ahead of the game. Like, and you know he had the hemp. I just saw you with a hemp two O. I remember yeah. almost 15 years ago when that shit was just an idea. No, I know. And I remember being around him and him pitching that shit 
the people that we were around and me being crazy. like them. I remember he would just come with like gadgets and shit. He would just be like, I got the kind stack. Remember the kind yeah. stack? Remember yes, that? bro, the kind <laughs> stack. He had the vape pens. He was the yeah. first with a vape pen, yeah, man. Yeah, trippy sticks and all that. And yeah. I mean, he's the first guy to put weed in a bag and brand it. Yeah, exactly. you know, it, that, you know, as far as I know that we in, in, of our culture and our generation, you know, yeah. what I'm saying he revolutionized the weed game, bro. He's a he's a smart dude, but I think really what it comes down to is passion. He's passionate about marijuana culture. He is, and he's passionate he about music. And he does he doesn't have to do music. He does it because he loves it. No, and I and think it's like a, it's kind of it. like a commercial for all the other. He does, you know what I mean? But that's, see, again, that's being ahead of the game because that's what rap is turning into. Whether it's a clothing brand, whether it's food, it's rap is becoming the side dish to the entree. It's just becoming one thing that you connect other things that you do to, like you said, other sources of income uh, because th that's just how the game has changed. Yeah, man. So, you know, uh, we just start around man and I think you know like I said that was the Jack of Rob Lowe era mm -hmm. I think he was he was loving that sound you know I, I was into the sample eerie kind of sped up sample shit as well mm -hmm. so you know he just kind of gravitate towards it man and and uh you uh before you I mean before you know it um I was doing like the majority of those albums, those projects, you know, he was calling on me to do the majority of that stuff, man. And um, I remember him being so excited, like being in Houston, like, cause I just got Slim Thug on Life of a Star, or I just got BG on this one. And I'm like, you know, hey, this guy's networking. He's doing his thing. And people fuck with him. The cuts with the craziest features, bro. Yeah, because people fuck with him, man. Mm -hmm. You know, and then slowly but surely, Whoever was coming to the Bay was, you know, rapper-wise, was hitting them up for that weed. Yep, so, yep. I mean, hey, man, we could talk about burn forever, man. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but, but I know I'm just saying, like, uh, the, the, you know, he, uh, he pulled it off, man, and 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 uh, just to see where he's taking it now, it's almost kind of surreal. It's like, damn, you did all this right, right under my nose, man, and you know, it's it's. What, what I, like what, you said, bro, he fell in love with the business. Every time you see him, he'd have a gadget, he'd have an idea. <laughs> and, bro, that same passion he still has to this day, everything he does is, is a passion play. It's not it's not a paper. It's not for the paper. It's, well, y'all ended up doing a collab album, which was did. dope to see. Yeah, it was, yeah. man. Yeah, I was grateful for that, for sure. And I think that probably helped introduce a lot of people to you as a rapper. Yeah, 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 I think so, man, because, you know, it's a generational gap, and Burn has, you know, allowed me to feature on a lot of his albums, which has kept me relevant, you mm -hmm. know what I mean, because uh, of his platform and, and, and where he's at today. So I definitely get, you know, the, the fans trickle down, you know what I'm saying? So I'm super, super grateful for that. And not long after that, you came with another solo album. Mm-hmm. And uh, you had a big push for that. You got a lot of support for it. What what made, what made you decide at this time? You know what? Now I'm gonna come with another solo. Well, man, shit, bro. I always felt like I never did enough with the rap stuff. You know what I mean? I always felt like I I, I shied away from it for whatever reason. Um, put the beats first. You know, as Stretch would say every time I see him, you still hating on yourself? You still hating on yourself? That sounds like some Stress would say. Yeah, meaning like, yo, when you going to put your music out, yeah. you know? And I'm such an overthinker and a heavy weed smoker that I'll make a song, listen to it a million times, and then it'll be old to me. And then, every, yeah. you know, I want to go do something else. And I think I love making music more than I love the art of having to actually be an artist. You know what I'm saying? I just like making the music more than I the like process being of creating. a rapper. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, the creative part has always been my thing, man. But um, uh, uh, as far as that album, bro, like, I mean, I, you, it's just so, so long overdue for me, man. You know, I feel like I, I kind of missed out on a lot of years where I could have been branding myself and going harder and and things like that. And like, 
as I get older, you want to have less regrets. You know what I'm saying? Less things on the table that I would have, could have, should have. You know what I mean? So, and aside from that, you know, uh, I think I got to the point, like you said, where me and Bernard did the collab album. You know, people people hitting me up. Oh, Cos, when you going to drop shit? A little bit of that mixed with, I had all these great songs sitting on my drive. And then... I started into getting a couple cool features, you know. I had the Wiz, I had Conway, I had Jada, you know, Styles P. I had some 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 bucket list features, you know, at least for me. So I was like, yo, I can't sleep on this, man. And I got to a point where I was like, yo, it's, I'm not getting no younger, man. Let's put this out, bro. You know, who gives a you know? And, and honestly, I'm super proud of it, man. And 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 uh, like. Like, you guys asked, like, how was it doing? Like, I don't know. Like, I don't really check analytics or, like... I think Shemp asked you that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Shemp was like, how's the album doing? I'm like, Fuck, I don't know, man. I just... <laughs> I know it was good. You know what I'm saying? I know I, I know it was good. I'm not going to call it a classic because I feel like a classic timing. Uh, you know, certain things that go into making a classic. And people don't realize that it's... A lot of the time, it's the timing of when that album came out that, that, that really makes something classic, like mm. Get Rich or Die mm-hmm. Trying. Mm-hmm. He had just been shot. It was, you know, Eminem son. Certain thing. Not to say the album wasn't an amazing body of work, but you know what I mean. Sure. The timing plays plays a big part. Um, so, uh, yeah, man. I just feel like I'm overdue, man. I feel like I'm, I'm probably... probably a, a better rapper... And I allow people to think, you know, and I felt like I owed it to myself and to the, you know, few fans I got or whatever, you know. It's dope, bro. It's yeah. inspiring. Yeah. Uh, I talk to younger artists. I talk to artists who are older. I talk to artists who are way older. But what I get is it's never too late. Doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. If you want to do it, do it. And um, I love talking to artists that have been in the game as long as you. Because I always get the sense that there's more to come. And so what do, you, what do you think are the next chapters of your story? What's the future looking like for Cosmo? Well, man, um, man, I just want to keep doing dope. Shit. And um, like you said, man, I always kind of, I think every older artist struggles with that. Like, is it too late? You know what I'm saying? Like, to miss my shot, am I too old to be doing this? Shit? You know? My mom will hit me and be like, Kazi, why don't you rap about something different? You know? <laughs> it's, it's drugs you're rapping about. Then I said, why don't you rap about some of the good times? I said, Mom, point me to the moment that you have in your head that you that you that you're thinking of that you would like me to rap. I remember when you used to ride your bike with no hands. And won't you rap about that? <laughs> <laughs> people don't want to hear that, you know? I might, yeah, some people no, might want to hear that. It's funny, you know, it's <laughs> no, just funny. You yeah. So, you know, I, I struggle with that a lot. I'm old, you know, I'm like, damn, should I quit doing this? Shit? But at the end of the day, man, it, I think it all depends on what your purpose is as an artist. Like, are you just doing this to put out some dope shit, not expecting a ton in return? Now, if you're a 40-year-old artist and you've never put out an album and you're just getting into this shit, and you and, and you don't have a job and you're like, yo, I want to make a career and make money, then you might have a problem. You know what I'm saying? But hey, who's to who's to I, knock I, who, man? I, I think mean, we're we're gonna see it. I think we're gonna start seeing 40-year-old debut rappers, 50-year-old debut rappers. I mean, rappers. not to say it like that, but um Killer Mike, man, just cleaned up at the Grammys. Exactly. He's an older rapper. I mean, but he's been paving. That's what I'm saying. Like, don't think. You're gonna do your first album. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mike's been You're paving. Pick up a Mike's been for the paving very first his time road. I mean, he's been he's age. been working up to that moment for yeah, 30, yeah, sure. 40 years. So it's different. Like when people are like, yo, what about 40? He's 50 still. Yeah, but he made it his bones early on. He he set his foundation early. So there's certain people that I feel like can go forever, like a Snoop Dogg, a 40. People are going to still want to hear them when they 60, 70 because it's the iconic character they are. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and um, so when people are like, oh, it's never too late. It's like, ah, I don't know. You don't understand. These, these guys, these guys 
made their bones early on, man. You know, don't listen to this guy, y'all. It's never too late. Follow your dreams. <laughs> I don't even. If I say it's too late hey. for you, that means it might be too late for me, and it ain't never too late for me. Hey, no, it ain't. But never I heard you say, "I'm don't just pick be up a, a realist, man. Don't pick up a pen for the very first time at 40 years old and yeah. think it's gonna be an overnight." I'm not day. saying you can't win later on in the game, yeah. but like I'm just saying, some of these dudes that did. They set their foundation up right. Well, what's know? next for you, though? What do you got coming up? Oh, uh, man, my son, to? man. I actually, my, my son, man, um, he goes by the name of Don Polo, man. He's really dope. I'm trying to trying to light the fire on him. He featured on my album, actually. I did a video with him. Um, I want to I wanna get aggressive with dropping some of his music. He's in his early 20s. He does like the, you know, the R and B auto tune. Not not auto tune as much, but that young, mm -hmm. the young melodic rap. Mm -hmm. Super dope, man. He's going to school, going to college and shit. So I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to light a little fire under him. I feel like he got potential. But other than that, man, I'm just keep making beats and and um, you know, putting plays together, man. Staying behind the scenes, making shit happen quietly. Some things maybe not as quietly, you know, but um, yeah, just still, honestly, bro, I'm just still trying to get better. You know what I mean? I'm still trying to get better, man. Like for me, it's it's about the music, bro. Like I I don't even care if I go a whole year without making a placement as long as I'm getting better. You know, I like, like I still want to learn piano fluently and like, Still want to master the the you know the art of of music theory and and I feel like musically I left myself so much room to grow because I just scratched the surface man everything with me is like a vibe man like a mood you know like I could create the mood but on the technical side pro man the, the technology is so advanced and growing so fast that like bro if you're not constantly you know. Uh, educating yourself on these new techniques and, you know, whatever, whether it's plugins or programs, and you'll be left behind, man. So, like, even when I had an MP, I just scratched the surface. I never read a manual. I never figured out the thing 100%. I just do whatever I needed to do, and then that's it. So, even with keys, like, I could play keys more than, like, your average rap producer, you know? And like a lot of kids you see nowadays, they just use a mouse and like an actual keyboard mm -hmm. pad, not an actual keyboard. Like I remember I went to make beats with a kid and I showed up with a control, a MIDI controller. And he's like, oh, I forgot you use those. You know how to play like some of these dudes say never, <laughs> never, you know. So and that's how I feel like you said, like, you know, making a beat and getting your emotion and your feelings like I want to play it. It's like the energy's coming out. I don't want to just click a mouse and move yeah. shit around. You know, it's not quite the same. I think that's like the equivalent of an artist that's just thinking of words rather than rapping from his heart. Mm. Someone is just moving a mouse around, clicking shit. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can get your point across, but it's a different one that, you know, you playing the keys. It's a certain feeling, certain emotions. So, yeah, I'm just still striving to be the best me, man. You know? Um, you know, push some of my son's shit out and Try to drop some more of my own stuff too, you know, not overthink it so much. Just kind of create the catalog, man, and, and kind of because that's kind of where we're at, you know. This is a, it's a catalog based game, you know. It's not one or two projects that are going to take off. It's, you might need twenty or thirty to really collect that good digital check and be able to actually, uh, you know, have a decent income. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, why not? Well, man, a true artist, ladies and gentlemen. I'm looking forward to seeing what the future has in store for you, bro. Appreciate you, my brother. As I always say, this platform is here for the artists in the real Bay Area, people who made this place so special. So anytime you need our support, we're right here. Absolutely, man. Appreciate it. Honored to be here, man. And Love I'm what you guys do. Thank you, bro. And I'm sure we're going to stay locked in and there's much more to come. And um, Absolutely, man. Keep doing what you're doing, man. You're doing a good justice to the... Some of the people behind the scenes in the Bay that don't get their everyday flowers, man. You bringing them on and shining that light on them, man. And um, we need it, you know? Thanks, homie. Yes, sir. Appreciate you, bro, to the Absolutely. fullest. Absolutely. Cos Pacino, ladies yes, and gentlemen. Yes, indeed. Legendary.
History of the Bay podcast. Shout out to the whole team working hard tonight. Everybody out there watching, everybody out there supporting, all my people, much love to the whole Bay. It's Dregs Wine signing off with Cosmo. Peace, y'all. Peace. Recognize where you got the game. We got our own style, got our own slang. Northern California is a West Coast thing. This is the history of the Bay. Recognize where you got the game. We got our own style, got our own slang. Northern California is a West Coast thing. This is the history of the Bay.